I'm Giovanna Mbezi, I'm the executive director of LACNETS and also a patient and a patient advocate. Thank you all for coming today. Um, happy spring. It's a beautiful day out today in Los Angeles and we want to welcome all of the people joining us online as well. Thank you for joining the live stream. And thank you all for being here. I see a lot of new faces. Um, we're always curious how people find out about LACNETS, so I'd like, just like to ask, um, how did you find out? about our meeting today, for those of you who are new. Online. Online, and you're from San Diego, right? So you know about the San Diego group, our SD Nets. Anyone else, how did you hear about the meeting today, if you're new? Also online. Online, where online? Oh, great, we have more people from San Diego. Well, thanks for joining us, and Yes, well, so nice to see you. Um, so I have some announcements, and um, first I want to just mention some of our meetings. So LACNETS has meetings most every month of the year, and we rotate between UCLA, uh, Cedar sinai and City of Hope, and also the Cancer Support Community. Um, so we try to cover the whole Los Angeles area. and. In May, um, then we do one annual conference a year, which is a big full day conference. So uh, our conferences were really excited. We actually opened registration last night. The conference is going to be on June 8th, and it's at Cedar sinai this year. Um, this is an amazing opportunity for one, to hear so many medical professionals who are net experts all in one place, all in one day. And if you've ever you know, tried calling the offices and it's press one for this and two for this, here's a place where you can walk right up to the doctors and have a conversation with them. Um, so I encourage you to register for that. Um, it's gonna be a really exciting conference this year. In fact, we just confirmed last night, uh, Lori Todd, who is the insurance warrior, um, if you look at her website, insurancewarrior.com, she's an expert. She's actually a cancer patient survivor, and she fought her denials for insurance for coverage, and she won. And since then, she has gone on to help hundreds of people with their own insurance issues, and she's written two books, which she'll be bringing with her. Um, so we're really happy that she's going to give a talk at our conference on June 8th. And uh, so the next meeting will be May 11th, and this is going to be at the Cancer Support Community um, with a very well-known uh, net specialist named Dr. Eric Liu. And Dr. Liu is a surgeon. He's in Denver, and he'll be joining us for this meeting. He's a very popular speaker. He also works with patients, uh, you know, some surgeons, just do surgery, and then the, the, you're followed by your oncologist and the rest of the team. Dr. Liu really treats patients in all aspects and follows their treatment as well as surgery. Um, so he's gonna be talking about making decisions, PRRT, surgery, and more. And that's actually the theme of our conference this year, because as many of you know, one of the biggest things and toughest things we'll do as patients is make a decision about what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and in what order to do it. So um, that's going to be a great talk. At, that's at CSC in Redondo Beach. And uh, our calendar is online. I think it's also, oh, perfect timing. It's rotating up here with our meetings for the rest of the year. Um, and I'm wondering how many people here are newly diagnosed? Wow, quite a few. So new as in the last six months? Is that your husband? And how recently was he diagnosed? Oh, very recently. So, And you in the back, how long ago? January. January. So this is all very new. Um, 
there's a lot of, I, I call it learning to speak net, so <laughs> it's like learning a foreign language in some ways. There's a lot of terminology, there's a lot of medical terms that are, are just going to feel like you're learning another language at first, and we're all here to help you. Um, the other thing about coming to these meetings and to the conferences, meeting other patients and meeting people who have been going through this for a long time. I was diagnosed in 2005. So we're here to support you and we have an amazing program called NetConnect, which is specifically to help connect patients with other patients. So if you're interested in that, um, Lisa Yen is here and she is our director of programs, and um, Lisa Yen is managing the Net Connect program. So, if you would like, if you feel like, you know, I really just need to talk to another patient, or I really just need to talk to somebody to um, know, learn more about this, it's all new, or maybe you're about to have surgery and you want to talk to someone who's had that procedure, or you're going to have PRRT. Um, so, we can help you um, go through this and learn more about it. It's always great to talk to someone who's actually had the procedure. Uh, it's a little different sometimes than speaking with the doctors. Um, and speaking of that, there's a form that we've passed out called Net Vitals. So this is something that was developed by Lisa and myself with Dr. Dan Lee uh, from City of Hope. And the whole idea of this was to help improve the communication between physicians and patients. So this is, um, what we did was come up with the 20 most important questions for net patients, um, and we put them all in one document. And the idea is not that you will be able to look at this and fill it out in five minutes, but that maybe you won't, maybe you'll only know your name and date of birth, and the rest of it, um, you won't know what those things mean. But that's part of our education and helping people understand what are the questions I need to ask and uh, if I'm seeing a net specialist, what are the kinds of things they're going to ask me and talk about? Um, so w we also have a webinar on this that takes you question by question through how to fill this out. And so that's uh, Net Vitals. And one last thing, we have a private email group. And Lindsay Judevine is here, who many of you met and got her emails. She's our director of communications. She keeps us all in order and going. Without Lindsay, <laughs> we would not be here today. Um, and so we have a private email group, and Lindsay has a sign-up sheet that she's going to pass around. This is something that we created fairly recently, and it's a way that's different from, say, some of the Facebook groups where, you, you know, it's all very public. This is a group of email just within our own LACNETs, and it's a way also to connect with other patients. Um, one of the recent discussions was sandostatin versus lanreotide, which one should I do? And so that started a conversation online um, for people getting opinions and, and being able to ask questions. Um, so that'll, you'll see that coming around now. And uh, so today we have a very special, very timely um, discussion on PRRT. And there are many aspects to this. Uh, everything ranging from just getting insurance coverage and approval to why you would want to think about doing this as part of your treatment for neuroendocrine cancer and also what the actual um, procedure is like. And um, I can tell you I've been uh, in previous years going to Germany for PRRT and the fact that we can have it right here at UCLA and drive, you know, not that far, and then be home in your own bed that night is really an amazing thing that we now have this in the United States and right here at UCLA, and that UCLA has been doing so many of these PRT therapies. Um, so we have three speakers today. We'll have lots of time for Q&A. And first, I would like to welcome Dr. Bari. And, oh, there you are. <laughs> Please come up and join us. Uh, so. Dr. Bari is going to uh, 
help us understand PRRT and from a uh, treatment point of view and why this would be important for neuroendocrine cancer patients. Um, welcome, thank you for having us. Um, this is my first time here, but I see uh, from what I saw, many of you guys, this is also the beginning of the journey. Uh, so thank you for making us a part of that. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today very briefly is just to give you an overview as to how we image the neuroendocrine tumors, how we stage them, or what the imaging part of the staging is, um, selecting the correct patients for PRRT, uh, the PRRT part itself, um, and any future considerations or any uh, research projects that we have uh, going on at UCLA. So how do we image the neuroendocrine tumors? So basically, historically, the imaging was the anatomic imaging, which was either using x-rays, uh, magnetic fields, ultrasounds, and they would just basically make an image structure and show you the structure of uh, whatever you're imaging. So basically, if you are shining an x-ray through a sphere, what you're gonna get uh, as an image is the image of a sphere. Okay, and basically that's all you can say. You can say, well, this is how it looks like, um, and that's the size of it, and based on that, you can come up to a conclusion. Uh, that's basically how a CT scan is being produced, by shining x-rays through your body and then um, putting the different slides together, so you have something, this, this we call a coronal view, and you have a lot of detail on that, actually. You know, you can see many, many things. Uh, you can see here the, oh, can you see the cursor? No? Well, um, you can see the heart, you can see the lungs, you can see the, so, heart, lungs, liver, here's the stomach, you can see the intestines here, you can see muscles, you can see bones. Basically, you might be able to pick out abnormalities on that. You know, if the tissue has deformed in a way that is other than the normal that you are um, used to. But if the tissue hasn't done that, you might not be able to see that. What does molecular imaging do? Um, well, we use radioactive tracers in nuclear medicine. And basically, molecular imaging is a way to see what's happening inside the body at a molecular level. Um, molecular and cellular level, basically see what your cells are doing at this point uh, in your body. And unlike x-rays, CTs, or ultrasounds, or other diagnostic imaging modalities that we have, um, uh, this one, which, and those offer anatomical imaging and anatomical uh, information, uh, here you can actually see inside the body and see how it is basically functioning uh, from inside. Um, and the tracer that we like to use for neuroendocrine tumors is the dodatate or the net spot uh, that you have heard of uh, obviously before. And this would be an image that is produced by PET net spot PET or dotatate PET. Uh, that is the same patient where you saw the CT images before. Now all of a sudden you can see this big blob of darkness of a different kind um, and it basically tells you, oh look, there is something happening in the body right there and then. And actually, if you look close, I don't know if the uh, projector actually can show it, you can probably see, well, maybe, maybe there is something over here. Maybe it's something that is very small, and I can assure you it would have been very, very hard to see that on a CT scan. Basically, let's, let me show you this image of the CT. Now, when you look back, you might be able to see, well, this portion of the liver, it just looks a little bit different than the rest of it. Okay, the confirmation comes with a... Um, molecular imaging basically showing you, yes, there is something. 
And then basically you can fuse these images, you can combine the structural and the functional imaging information together. And as an example, uh, what we do in nuclear medicine, you might hear of SPECT CT, uh, PET CT, or at some places where they have a PET MRI. And basically this is the fused image, all right? Um, now you know that this lesion is in the liver, and you might even now pick out and see, oh, well, that was an area that, that showed up, that lit up on the PET uh, image. And is there something underlying that we can see on CT? So that is actually a very, very great help in being able to diagnose and see what the extent of the disease is. And that brings me over to staging of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and what the role of imaging might be in, in staging of neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, for staging of the neuroendocrine tumors, we use the TNM staging system, which gathers information to describe the amount and the spread of the disease in the body, okay? So here on this side, this table, I just uh, randomly picked one, is the staging system for the duodenum, ampulla, jejunum, and ileum, basically the midgut. Um, and every neuroendocrine tumor can have its own um, set of staging system, which is a little bit different based on the anatomical and the function of that organ. So the staging system, the TNM staging system, comprises of three different components. It's the T system, which talks about the primary tumor, basically talks about how large the tumor is and what the spread of the tumor is within its very near um, uh, nearby tissue. Uh, the N talks about the regional lymph nodes and whether the lymph nodes are involved or not. M talks about distance meta uh, distant metastases, whether the cancer has spread to other portions in your body or not. Okay, and once you have that information, you can all put that together in different manners. Every everybody's cancer is different, so the staging is going to be different. You know, some, somebody might have, two people might have the same size of cancer, but then you don't know what the uh, nodal involvement is or the metastasis is. And basically, once you do that, you come to a staging group. So basically, for this particular one, you can have a stage 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, and 4. Imaging can help in right off the bat um, being able to tell you whether there is a distant metastasis, whether the local nodes might be involved or not. You still need to get tissue samples, um, but then with imaging, what helps is you don't need to get tissue samples on everything. You know, once you got a couple, then if a, an area shows up, you know this is probably going to be cancer. So for example, here, um, this patient got a dotate. Uh, the patient has uh, probably a primary was resected and was here in the um, small bowel. But now a, um, a focus, a spot shows up in, in the thorax area. And when you combine that with the anatomical images, you can see this is a lymph node that is sitting in the hilar region in your lungs, and basically that would put the patient into a stage four. Here on this side, you can see the primary cancer is still in the small bowel, but already the liver has cancer in it. So basically that helps putting the patient in staging the patient uh, for the surgeons and for the oncologists to make a good decision on what kind of a treatment you might need going down the road. On top of the staging, there is also the grading of the neuroendocrine tumors. And you guys all have heard it before. Uh, they tell you you have a well-differentiated tumor or you have a poorly differentiated tumor or you have a high-grade or a low-grade tumor. Okay? And what it is, it is basically talking about the KI-67 index uh, that determines that. Basically, and this is done by the pathologist. So basically the pathologist has to have the slides and then they can this special stain that gives a sense of how aggressive the tumor is, okay? So basically if the, they, um, 
say that the KI67 is below 3%, then uh, you are a grade one, low grade, well differentiated. The same is uh, with uh, 3 to 20, you're still within a well differentiated, uh, moderate grade inter or intermediate grade uh, neuroendocrine tumor. And if it is more than 20%, that would put you into a poorly differentiated uh, category. And that's also the high grade tumor. So all this is done. Now your doctor, your oncologist is tell, telling you, well, uh, I think you need to, to get PRRT. Okay, how do we select the patients for PRRT? PRRT stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Basically what it does is you have the cancer cells and the cancer cells express the somatostatin receptor. It's uh, somatostatin receptor number two that is most abundant in the neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, there are five uh, different uh, somatostatin receptors on the cells. And um, once basically they express this receptor, um, which a lot of people call as the keyhole, you need to have a key to access that. Um, and uh, the key, that one is the dodotate. So basically it's a peptide that is um, uh, bound to a chelator. So peptide, chelator, and then you have the radioisotope, okay? In this particular case, it's the gallium 68, which is used to produce PET images, okay? It emits positrons, which a detector, a specific detector, a specific scanner picks up and produces images with. So that would be a diagnostic scan. And it can be followed up uh, with treatment. So basically now what you can do is, all you need to do is exchange the radio tracer here uh, from something that you use for imaging into something that you can use for treatment. So basically now this molecule here, the lutetium-177, has enough energy to be able to destroy those cells that it binds to, okay? So key, keyhole. Now what this uh, uh, cartoon doesn't show is actually uh, this whole complex gets internalized and then uh, kills or tries to kill the cell from inside. So the word theranostic that you have heard many times before basically comes from the uh, therapy portion and the diagnostic theranostic. And then we look at your scans to see what it looks like. What we want ideally is if a patient has a very high somatostatin receptor density. So basically you can see that everything here is very dark. Basically the uptake into the tumor is more than the background, basically more than the liver background. So basically that would tell us, well, uh, this tumor has very likely very high somatostatin receptor density. Um, and then there's also different categories, moderate somatostatin receptor density. So basically you can see that this patient has um, lymph nodes that are involved here in the neck area, but they're not expressing the somatostatin receptors as much as uh, the case here on the left. Basically, the uptake at most places is very similar to the liver. There is, however, a small area up top that has a little bit more of an uptake. And here on the right side, we know the patient has a neuroendocrine tumor. However, the uh, expression of the somatostatin receptors is low. Basically, we can't see much this patient would not be a very good candidate for therapy while the patient on the left side would be a very good candidate for therapy. The one in the middle can still get a therapy. Yeah, my doctor's talking about embolization. Sure. And we're concerned that if they do the embolization, it'll reduce the density over to the right and make her not susceptible to this uh, lutetium dotate. And she has uh, carcinoid tumors in her lymph as well that, are, that wouldn't be reached by the treatment because they only would go in the liver. So is that a concern or not? 
I understand your point. So basically the question was whether with an embolization treatment, your cancer, the way it expresses these receptors changes in a way. I don't think so. No. So basically what it would do is if we don't see it, if you got treatment and then now we don't see it anymore, it's because probably it got killed. The cancer was treated. Okay. But then the areas that were not treated, um, we don't have any data at this point saying that because of the treatment, they have changed the way they express the somatostatin receptors. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So this is another case, a uh, patient we imaged very recently. And I wanted to show you how a scan, however, within the same patient can have very heterogeneous, so basically, many different ways of showing itself. So basically this patient has areas of very intense uptake in the liver, so where the tumors are expressing a lot of the somatostatin receptors. However, there are some lymph nodes. Uh, I don't know if you can see that here on this side. They are sitting behind the bladder. I changed the orienta orientation of the patient a little bit so you, that you ca guys can see behind the bladder on this image. And um, as you can see, those lymph nodes are not expressing a lot of the somatostatin receptors. They are still doing some, but not a lot. Uh, this lymph node here, down here in the pelvis actually, it only expresses the somatostatin receptors at one portion of it. The rest of it, it doesn't. So basically, it is differentiating, all right? However, this patient still could be treated with somatostatin receptor with PRRT, basically. Uh, some areas are gonna be treated better, some areas not. And then, so basically, uh, this is the, uh, another case we had recently, a patient with poorly differentiated cancer with a high uh, KI-67 of 70%, okay? So that was the staining um, that we use to put a grade and then tell you whether the cancer is well differentiated, poorly differentiated, high grade or low grade. So this one would be a high grade cancer with a KI-67. However, as you can see, it is expressing the somatostatin receptors abundantly. There's a lot of it. You know, basically tells us, yes, even though by numbers this is a poorly differentiated, this is a high grade tumor, still it has a lot of the uh, receptors that we want to go after with a PRRT, okay? So just the numbers itself is not uh, telling the whole picture. So PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, that's what it stands for. And you have heard many other terms, so basically putting them here so that there is less confusion. It can also be called Lutathera, okay? This is the trait name that they have and that they're, they're selling it out. But you might also hear uh, lutetium-177 dotatate therapy or SSTR therapy, which stands for somatostatin receptor therapy, okay? So don't be confused when people say talk, uh, this is basically talking about the same thing. So it's a prescription medicine. It's used to treat uh, patients with a type of uh, cancer, which is called the gastroentero uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, the GEPnet, uh, which are positive for uh, the hormone receptor somatostatin. Um, and they are basically arising from the foregut, midgut, and the hindgut. So basically describing that they can be anywhere in the, um, uh, in the bowels. Um, um, and that is basically what, what this drug is FDA approved for. And in the, it has now become a standard of care for low-grade neuroendocrine tumors which are progressing after first-line somatostatin receptor therapy. And it was uh, FDA approved on January 26, 2018. And as you guys, some of you know, uh, we were offering that as an expanded access uh, trial at UCLA before it got FDA approval. So your doctor, your endocrinologist, your surgeon has seen you and then they're telling you, well, I think you need PRRT. What you need to do is you, you're going to get a consultation with 
if you come to UCLA with us with the nuclear medicine department. And we're going to look at the images. We're going to look at the pathology report. Uh, we might have had to talk to your uh, doctor if they were local at UCLA or not. And we might have already talked about you on in tumor board. Okay, so basically we're going to discuss that and we're going to come to a consensus. Is that a good therapy for you? Are there any other, um, a anything else that might prevent you from getting that? We're going to get uh, more in detail with that with Lindy's talk. And so basically if, if we are going to go proceed with the treatment, you're going to get uh, four cycles of infusion, which is given every eight weeks. And the time that you're going to spend with us is approximately six to eight hours. Um, historically, now well, we can actually probably cut it down even more to five right here. The side effects, Lindy is going to talk about that um, in detail. Um, most of the time it's uh, nausea, abdominal pain, fatigue, and um, decrease of blood counts, which is just temporarily. It dips down and then it comes back again. The results that we're expecting, okay, and this is what we're going to talk in consultation uh, when we see you. It's basically, if you have the tumor here, what you're trying to do is uh, to slow it down. So it's quite rare for the cancer to um, go away totally, okay up to 25% of, uh, of the times it can go away or decrease in size, okay? Mostly it would be a decrease in size. However, um, up to 75% and that's the main goal, that's what we are trying and that's I, what I need you guys to understand is all we, we are trying to do is to get a control on your disease basically so at, that it doesn't progress at the same rate that it was before, slow it down, make your life better, get rid of some side effects if you have any. And in some cases, up to 25% of the time, the cancer will progress even though we are doing that treatment at this point. So, and uh, these numbers, they all come from the Nether trial. You have heard of that. This was a very pivotal trial um, uh, uh, which showed that the uh, progression-free survival at 20 months for the cohort of patients that they did uh, was much, much, much higher than if you would get the um, normal uh, treatment um, with uh, long-acting um, uh, somatostatin analogs. Now, a couple of questions that I got beforehand. Let's discuss that right now, and maybe it answers some of your questions. How do I know I'm a candidate? Basically, we discussed that. You need to have a scan and uh, a professional uh, physician, somebody has to look at that scan and make a decision. Are you expressing the somatostatin receptors enough so that we can go ahead with the treatment or not? Are there any other side effects that we are encountering? Is there anything else happening with you at this point that might prevent you from getting uh, the treatment? How recent does the uh, gallium scan need to be? Now, well, we have an internal guideline uh, which talks about whether it should be within the six month. I like the scan to be as uh, recent as possible because it would also uh, serve as a baseline for your treatment, you know? seeing, okay, well, we're going to start the treatment. This is your baseline. This is how you look like. And then let's see down the road after the treatment is done what you look like. Now, we have done that before also where patients came in and for whatever reason they didn't have any recent scan. Uh, it was a year old or something like that. It would still give us enough information. When we look at it, we see, yes, there is a lot of disease that has um, uptake. So basically, uh, we can go ahead and do the treatment. Can I still be treated with high-grade uh, neuroendocrine tumor? And the answer is yes. Basically, on the images that I showed you with this patient with a high-grade tumor with a KI-67 of um, 70%, that patient is still a very good candidate. So basically every patient's tumor is different. We have to look at every case by case and then make a decision based on, based on your tumor. How do you assess during, in between, or after the treatment to know if it's working? 
we don't like to image in between. All right, so I know, I understand um, you guys come in, you get treatment, and you're anxious to know, is it working for me? Is it doing anything? Um, but what, uh, it doesn't give us enough information. We don't know what the cancer is doing at that point. I would say we would only image you in between if there is a dramatic change in your status, okay? Anything that might feel us, okay, no, you're not doing good on this treatment. So basically, we need to make a decision whether that's a good thing for you. But otherwise, if you're doing well, I would say you should finish your imaging and then uh, you should finish your treatment and then image at the end of the treatment. Um, and I would say let's wait about two months to see what, what the treatment has done. The half-life of uh, Luthathera, of the lutetium-177, is 6.7 days. So basically, it um, tells us that by 10 half-lives, most of your, the radiation has done what it needs to, to do, and um, any possible inflammation that was caused in the tissue has also subsided enough so that we can get a better picture of um, what you're at. Another interesting uh, question was elevated serum bilirubins. Um, could that be a red flag in disqualifying the patient for PRT? Could that explain um, could you explain why, if it makes a difference, whether the uh, increase in, in the liver enzymes is due to the PRT treatment or any other treatment? And uh, the answer is, well, yes, it is a red flag because it tells us that your uh, liver is not functioning very well. We don't want to do something that makes your life worse. At the same time, we want to treat you as good as we can. And it doesn't matter where it comes from. It warrants a good um, conversation between the treating physician, between your oncologist and the nuclear medicine uh, department doctor to see where you are really with the numbers. So I'm not somebody who likes to treat numbers. The patient itself is telling us more um, than the numbers the liver enzymes, for example, do and you get a better understanding of why is that. Can the patient handle a little bit more of the treatment and might the treatment help the patient or not? Another question that came up is, can there be a carcinoid crisis during or after PRT treatment? We haven't seen any carcinoid crisis at UCLA thankfully yet but i found a paper basically that talked about it in australia um, where they treated patients um, who basically were flagged as or identified as high risk uh, because they either had previous history of carcinoid crisis or high tumor burden and markedly elevated tumor markers so the answer is yes it might happen we haven't had it it's extremely rare though yes <coughs> so basically, the symptoms that you have, the carcinoid symptoms, which can be uh, elevated heart rate, a lot of diarrhea, and these kind of things. All right, so I'm going to skip on that. And let me just briefly talk about the future research that we are conducting at UCLA. So there is another imaging compound on the horizon which is very similar to the uh, net spot. Uh, it's called, at this point, it's the OPS-202. It's being offered by the company Ipsen. We are enrolling patients here at UCLA for that. Um, there have been preliminary research in Europe that has shown it's very safe and uh, it can work. The advantage that it might have uh, uh, when you compare it to the Doda Tate or the Doda Talk, is that it has a lower background uptake, especially in the liver. Okay, while the uptake in the liver on Doda Tate and Doda Talk is high, it is lower here with this compound. So basically, it might allow us to see the tumors, the metastases in the liver better, and distinguish it from the background. Um, 
Basically, what it is, it is an antagonist compound, while the Dota Tate and the Dota uh, Talk are agonist compounds. And um, it has a better improved receptor binding, basically because it doesn't only bind uh, to the active somatostatin receptor 2, um, but also it binds to the inactive ones. So basically, you can, in theory, hit that cell a lot better, a lot more with this compound uh, than not. So basically, down the road, what you can do is also use it for therapy. So the same way that I showed you with the Dota Tate, you can do that and hopefully deliver a higher dose, more specific into that tumor with this one uh, versus uh, the uh, Dota Tate. So basically, if it happens, um, it might be an, another improvement down the road. So basically, uh, we have this uh, study open at UCLA. We have it open for a while. It's quite hard, as some, some know here, to enroll patients because uh, there is a good amount of uh, inclusion criteria to do it, but even more exclusion criteria. Uh, and it's quite... Um, Involved. So basically, if a patient shows up and wants to do that, so basically they would need to have a Dota Tate scan beforehand. They would have to come in with that and then uh, come to us on four different occasions. You know, one to see what the blood work is like, sign the consent, and then there's going to be two imaging sessions involved, uh, which are uh, up to six, seven hours because we need to collect blood and we need to collect some urine and send it to the sponsor and yeah with that um uh, just before we bring up lindy i wanted to mention a few things that came up in dr barry's excellent talk um one person asked about what is ki67 and so that's on our net vitals form and a net a ki67 would be something that you would get either through a biopsy or through uh, having surgery and then them doing a biopsy on that tissue most often with nets, it's going to be a liver biopsy, although it could be something else. And that KI67 number, um, which is done by the pathologist, is a really important number, as you could see from determining the grade of the tumor. And um, that is uh, something we've also talked with people about how to get your pathology report. So if you've had surgery or had a biopsy, then there is a pathology report, and that's something you can request from your records um, if you don't already know that number through your, or something you can discuss with your oncologist. Um, and one other question I had for Dr. Bari is um, about withholding. If you're on a somatostatin analog, there's a recommended period of time before PRT uh, to not not have your shot. So would you like to make a comment just on that? Uh, sure, I'm sure yeah. Lindy is yeah. gonna talk about that also, but then um, yes, so there is this um, notion that we should hold it for four weeks before we do the PRT. Basically the idea is we are targeting the same receptors anyway, so let's not block them um, with the, however, uh, there have been some people who say, well, no, not really, and we might be able to um, give both uh, together. So who knows what the future shows, and we need some more research on that and see what the real data is. At this point, the recommendation based on the NETR trial is to hold it for four weeks. Yes, the long acting. The short acting, you can be on it and you need to hold it only for 24 hours prior to the treatment, okay? The long acting is the one that you get every four weeks, correct, okay? And one other thing to the KI67, um, as Giovanna said correctly, basically it comes from the um, pathology, so basically you need tissue, but keep in mind um, the tumors if you have some, many in your body, they might have different levels of KI-67, okay? And you can't really sample all of them. One question, it was in one of your slides that the uh, PRRT is uh, only available in progressive entities. What happens when you have a 
Yes. So the question is, it came up in one of the slides, uh, that the PRRT is available for progressive disease. Okay. What if you are not progressing? So if you are basically stable. If you are stable, that's what you want. Okay. Well, I know. I mean, as a patient's uh, point of view, yes. You want to decrease, you want to decrease. However, this is a um, conversation that should be warranted with the oncologist and see, uh, is it the right time to do that? So as of now, uh, what uh, PRT is approved for here in the United States is if uh, you're progressing. Now, it's possible uh, every um, insurance might handle a little bit differently. Um, to do that, if, if the insurance uh, pays for it, sure, it can be done. But that's, that's where we are right now here in the United States. The question is how long to wait bef uh, with a short acting, yeah, um, before you do PRT, 24 hours. I say thank you and I think the next person and then we can take questions later, I guess. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. So I'd like to welcome now Lindy Gardner, um, who works at UCLA and, and works directly with patients getting PRRT. Welcome, Lindy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. As G. Vera said, I work with um, giving therapy directly to patients at UCLA for the PRRT. Um, and thank you for having us here today as well. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to go over today is um, what to expect prior to your visit, um, the infusion day, wrap up um, with side effects instructions and then also addressing the radiation aspects of treatment and finishing all infusions and what to expect the next steps. Um, some of it, it will be sort of coincided with what D Dr. Barry has gone over. I may overlap a little bit, but it may help with just some clarification as well. Um, one of the questions that came up um, before I move forward with the presentation was, um, is PRRT a first-line therapy for neuroendocrine tumors? Your first-line therapy with neuroendocrine tumors is still your SSA analogs, which is your injections that you receive in every four weeks. That is something that is a standard of care that you're going to receive for those, um, your tumors. PRRT is when that next comes into sequencing. It's like this is something that, as Dr. Barry has expressed, it's where, where does this come in after that kind of therapy? Obviously, on the EAP, it was extended out to the last line of treatment. Now, PRRT is being brought up, depending on whether it's focal or multifocal, how that's going to be used moving forward in the future. So it's very exciting that the PRRT is now available. It's another form of treatment for you to receive. And also, where are we going to be placing this in the future of your disease progression? as well. So this is, this is kind of new and exciting where we are with this and how we're moving forward. Okay, Lutathera, PRRT, LU177, Dota Tate, um, SSTR, all those names. Please don't get confused. It's a treatment. It's a therapy treatment that you'll receive for your tumor that you're going to receive through an intravenous infusion. Okay, just like if you go to receive chemotherapy, it's going to be very similar to that. You're going to receive that through a vessel in the, in, in the vein um, via an IV. It's classified as a, ra a radionuclide infusion, so it's not chemotherapy, it's nothing else, but this is the name of this therapy, what it is called. Um, we give it with a renal protectant. Um, when we administer the therapy, we don't want the, the, ra the radionuclide to get picked up by the kidneys, so we give a kidney infusion of amino acid that is delivered at the same time to reduce the uptake of the radioisotope into the kidneys as we deliver it. And this is where that time length comes in when we talk about the infusion therapy. Um, Dr. Barry expressed it was between six and eight hours. It's actually around about five hours. The original infusion, the actual infusion of the lutathera that you do receive is a 30 minute infusion. The rest is to protect the kidneys while we're infusing you. So it's, it's two infusions on one day, but one's a renal protectant, and one is the actual dose itself, the, the lutathera, or lutetium or PRRT. I'll use those names 
um, interchangeably, just so you can see it's all different. It's, it's, it means the same thing, it's just different, na <laughs> different names for that. Um, the renal protection, if you, like everybody else, you use Dr. Google for a lot of things, and you'll notice that there's been a lot of sort of, not, sort of, not scare tactics, but how are you going to feel about this therapy? A lot of people think, oh my gosh, you're going to come in, you're going to get severely sick when you have this therapy, nausea, vomiting, it's, you're going to be there all day. It really isn't like that. When they started out in the NETA trials, and in the e expanded access program here as well before it was FDA approved, there was an amino acid that we used and it had the right amounts of arginine and lysine, the two compounds that we need to protect the kidney, but it also had 23 other amino acids in that group that was infusing into your body. And that's what was making people sick during the infusion. It wasn't the actual um, lutathera, it was actually the amino acid infusions. And we've come a long way now. Instead of getting the commercial compound, we actually purchase the amino acid with just the two compounds in there. It's so much kinder on the system. It has the right amount of the arginine and lysine in there to protect the kidneys at the same time. And the infusion rate is reduced dramatically because it's catered for the infusion itself. The side effects are 95% reduced with the nausea, the vomiting, the uncomfortable feeling, and also just the time in the therapy the, uh, the time itself that we, we give it over. So please don't um, think that the therapy is going to be really bad and you're going to feel really sick. It's not the case. Some people still feel a little nauseous, but the amino acids that we have changed make a, an absolute night and day difference to how you're going to feel during that therapy infusion. Okay. We, we give an anti-nausea medication. It's called AMEND or Frosoprepitant. It's a strong anti-nausea medication that we give at the beginning. We maybe go a little bit overboard in giving such a high caliber an, um, anti-nausea medication, but we just want people to feel comfortable during the infusion. Um, some, cases, um, some institutions can give a Zofran infusion. Um, the AMEND's a little bit um, more potent than um, the Zofran. Some institutions just give a couple of tablets of Zofran because the effects are so greatly reduced with the, the two amis amino acid compound. Okay. Dr. Barry went over this. It's going to be a total of four infusions. Um, it's given um, eight weeks apart. We um, do stop your uh, somandostatin analog therapy, your injections. We stop those um, around about 28 days before we give the PRIT therapy because we want the washout of the somandostatin uh, from the cells off so we can target that with the um, actual P uh, lutathera. The short acting is 24 hours, as uh, Dr. Barry mentioned, um, that we want the washout from the cells as well so we can have good uptake when we infuse you. Um, you can go ahead and take the um, long-acting langreotide after the infusion. You can take it as, as soon as four hours after the therapy itself. Um, we recommend that um, you get it 24 hours afterwards. We don't give the shot in our institution after we give the um, uh, lutathera therapy. You'll still receive that at the clinic or your oncologist when you go to see them after the therapy has been given. Um, and then that'll maintain you on that cycle of every four weeks to receive your shots. And then every eight weeks you'll come in and you'll receive the lutathera prior to your next Sander statin shot. So we try and keep that schedule going for you so we don't have to have you off your shot for six weeks instead of four weeks. We like to march it out with your regimen of the shot and the um, therapy that you're going to receive. We will be doing um, blood draws and um, monitoring, as uh, Dr. Barry mentioned, um, your um, levels. Um, Lutathera is given, and it is, um, it's marotoxic, which means that it does um, uh, work on the bone marrow as well, but it's very transient. It happens, and it can knock out a few of your cells, it can drop them down, but the recovery time is normally between six and eight weeks for those to pick up. If you have a good blood count beforehand, um, your white cells and your red cells, you won't notice any drop in it. If you are a little bit low on the hemoglobin side, it could knock that down a little bit, but it should pick up after six, uh, between six and eight weeks. Um, we wanted the kidney function also, um, but with all the patients that have been studied within North America and the NETA trials, with the kidney protectant, there has been no kidney damage with this drug being administered. 
and that's in kidney uh, that's in patients with really marginal marginal kidney function also it really hasn't had any effect on the kidneys it's um, even though we can send in the consent that there could be a possibility we haven't noticed any changes in kidney function while giving this medication we don't use markers during therapy either a lot of patients ask oh, well my chromogranin a level's gone up or it's gone down there is no markers used during this therapy just as the same way as dr barry was talking about um imaging we don't image during the therapy as well um, we just monitor the um, for, uh, cytopenias so we're looking at red cells and white cells and making sure that we're okay to go ahead and treat uh, what to expect um, the day before um, this will all be coordinated with your oncology um, you'll come in with a consent um, a consult with the uh, nuclear medicine physicians you'll sign a consent and we'll schedule your appointments and Regina will go into how that's set up and how that works out looking at that at the scheduling point of time but you'll receive a call a confirmation call we'll have you come in but we'd like you to have a good night's rest before you come in we really don't want you to be very anxious about this but anything new always creates that level of anxiety and we understand that we want this to be as comfortable and as easy as possible just coming in and receiving that infusion just enjoying your day and then going home and that's what we'd really like you to experience and also we're very good conversationalists when we're there we get a lot of questions asked so we try and make that day go nice and smoothly for you um, pack a lunch um, if you're on a special diet please bring a special lunch with you we have a cafeteria on site you can bring you know buy purchase food there we do have small snacks and things to bring with you it may seem insignificant to mention this but it really is how you prepare for the day and every institution does it a little bit differently I'm purely speaking from UCLA and how we give our therapy at UCLA but these if you do go to UC San Diego or City of Hope then these are things that you could think about and asking and what they what services they provide while you're there so it just gives you sort of like a little idea of what you need to ask for or what to expect or what what services they offer to um, five hours it's not a very long time to fill because we find we get a lot of questions during that time but if you want to bring anything to read or watch movies things like that you can do that we don't limit what you can bring into the room you can touch things it's everything is okay it's just like a regular therapy day and you can drive yourself here as well or you can have somebody drive you also. It really depends upon to you how you feel um, about that. If it's a long distance, you may want somebody to come in and drive with you. This is what the room looks like. Um, we have it set up like this for licensing purposes. And also, if we have any spills or anything like that, we have to be able to clean it up. This kind of looks like, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? It looks pretty bad in there. And they're saying this stuff isn't bad, and yet the room's set up like this. This is purely to keep everything safe. So if we have a spill, we need to clean up, we have therapies day in and day out. It's set up like that so we can have ease of cleaning up as well. Um, interesting point to note, we did have a gentleman that came in and he'd been on Dr. Google and he knew, he said, we're gonna get really sick, you know, when they come in, I'm gonna vomit. He says, he saw the room and he says, I didn't realize that when I came in, I was gonna be vomiting this much. <laughs> it's, it's really, <laughs> It's really, you're not going to vomit. This is purely just from the um, uh, administration of the drug and any spills or anything like that. <laughs> but I, I, I totally understand, understood where he was coming from at that point. All right. Okay, you'll change into a gown. We want you to go home in the clothes that you arrived in. So if there's any spills or anything like that, you're not going home in our hospital gowns. It's better for you to change so then you can go home in your own clothes. Um, the IV will be placed. The pre-medication for nausea, we give normally one pre-med. If you're susceptible to being very nauseous and you've had other therapies where you've felt nauseous during those, we can increase those as well. Once we get a feel of, ta feel of what you feel at consult, if you are a person that gets very you know, sick very quickly, then we can give more steps and more um, nausea medications to assist with you so you don't get to the point where you do feel sick. But as I said, with the new amino acid compound, the, the nausea has been very minimal. A couple of people have felt a little bit nauseous, but we've had other um, medications in our toolbox that we've been able to work with with those patients. The renal protection will start. It runs for half an hour. It's just in a bag. It runs through the same IV that we place for the infusion of the therapy. After it's been running for 30 minutes, then you receive the lutetium, and that runs over half an hour. So that takes us to the hour mark there. 
once that's finished, you have three hours left of the amino acid therapy. So you're just basically letting that run in to protect the kidneys post um, injection of Lutathera. And then that's your time frame of the day. That's what it looks like. The infusion itself is set up. Um, it's the one IV, two pumps, the amino acid, and then the Lutathera. While we administer the, the um, Lutathera, you'll stay in your seat. We can't get you up to the toilet at that point because you're connected to uh, another vial. We can't move that with you. So for that 30 minutes, you just stay in one place and you sit while the infusion goes in. Once it's finished, it's taken out of the room and then the amino acid is left to go on. Um, once we've removed the vial of Lutathera from the room, then you can go to the restroom <laughs> if you need to go. Sometimes 30 minutes is a long time to wait at that point. Um, you will be encouraged to drink plenty of fluids. We want you to go to the restroom. We want you to empty your bladder. We want you to pass out all the medication that's not taken on board by your cells. Um, so we do encourage eating, drinking, and frequent bathroom breaks as well. And the bathroom is just across the hall, as you saw. It's literally from here to the other side of that table when you're there. Um, you will be using toilet paper after you go to the restroom for men and for women for the urination. You will be sitting in the sitting position to reduce splashing effects as well. Okay. Um, if you use a Depends or a pad, you'll be frequently changing those out. We want to make sure that the urine isn't sitting next to your skin after you've been to the restroom. So the urine is going to be the hottest part. And when I say hottest, it's going to contain most of the medication that, of the Lutathera that hasn't been absorbed by the cell. It's going to be coming out in the urine at that point. So we want you to discard what isn't taken on board by the tumor cells and you will be washing your hands with soap and water. We want you to rinse everything off after you've wiped. We don't want any alcohol or um, hand gels to clean your hands with. We need you to physically wash them with soap and water to wash anything off your hands. You'll receive a wrap-up treatment at the end of the day of you know what's happened. It'll be a discharge sheet with your next appointments that Regina will go over, um, your lab draw schedule sheet as well. Um, a script for Zofran if you need it, if you feel nauseous, we can give you a supply for th two or three days for that. Most patients already have a, 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 a nausea medication on board, but if not, we can provide that. We'll give a flight card, um, a wallet card and a flight letter for you to take with you. I'm going to go a little bit into the radiation um, part um, after this. Um, also, to schedule for your um, injections post-therapy for your long-acting uh, octreotide injections, you can go to the clinic or to your um, oncologist 24 hours later to receive that. But you can get it up to four hours after the injection of um, Lutathera on the same day. Um, we'll give you, we hand out LACNETS information to the patients that come in to all our therapies because we find that we actually still meet patients that come to us that don't know of this group. So we do hand information out from this. We also hand out educational information from AAA and you'll receive contact information for myself and Regina for any follow-ups that you need or any questions. And as we say, there's, there's no stupid questions. You just email, ask, and we will find out, figure out, or you know, help you with whatever you need to do. Because it's like, this is, it's a village and there's so many parts to this from the beginning of when you're diagnosed to going through that whole pathway of all the different paths that you can take and every person that we get in contact with and how we pass that information around is so important the network part of this um, just the neuroendocrine tumors is so important it's really the connections that we make and how we everybody's disease process is different it all looks different so we can we can treat with different kinds of um, if the patient if it's a high grade tumor low grade tumor all those different things nobody's one in the same here so we need that network of people so that's what we like to maintain and keep up to date with and also give information and pass information back the side effects from um, the Lutathera infusion. Um, I put up there that we've done over 200 infusions. Um, it's actually, I think, more than 250 infusions since we started on the expanded access and now through the FDA approved. And this is speaking purely from our experience of patients um, receiving the medication. Between day three and day seven, this is where people feel very tired. They're very achy. 
some feel a little nauseous on and off not as much vomiting but more than nausea also if you have a functional tumor, uh, some people ha ex experience a little bit more diarrhea at this point as well. Um, and it can last a few days. And we do recommend that you really hydrate at that point because if we're triggering a little bit more diarrhea, we don't want you to get dehydrated because we want you to hydrate because we're wanting you to clear the kidneys through, pass off any of the medication that's left on board. So it's really important that you do that. If you can't eat, then we'll recommend Gatorade or some electrolyte imbalance replacements that way. Uh, another interesting one was some hair thinning, um, especially noted by some of the nurse, um, some of the female uh, patients. They would brush their hair and they'd say, you know, I'm getting a lot more coming out in my, in my brush when I brush my hair. And this was noted, I'd say, out of about 50, 50 females that we treated, I'd say about eight to nine of those noticed some hair thinning, but it did come back. It wasn't a permanent um, loss. It was very transitional. Um, and the carcinoid crisis, as Dr. Byer mentioned, we have not seen any uh, carcinoid crisis. We've seen people get a little sick where they got a little hypotensive. We needed to hydrate them. They weren't feeling too good. We kept them for monitoring and observation, but no true crises where you know, we had to give them octreotide to reverse those effects, where their heart rate went up, their blood pressure went up. So we've been very fortunate in that way. I do know it does happen, but as I say, we haven't seen any. We've seen some patients with experience some excess pain um, that was normally in the areas where they had pain before, but it was transitionally a little bit greater at that point in time after the therapy, which could be due to some um, sort of like radio edema post-infusion where there was maybe some inflammation going on. But it's very unique to each of you as you experience the treatment. You'll have a little different feelings, but more general feelings are right there in, in um, the nausea, the fatigue, abdominal comfort, diarrhea, and um, hair thinning. I almost feel when I see this slide, I just want to go like this and tap my fingers um, about the waiting because we, we, we don't do anything in the meantime. So we're looking at four cycles of eight weeks apart. And I had one patient that really explained this beautifully to me. Um, she had been through a lot of different therapies and she came for PRRT therapy and um, she said, so can you tell what's going on while I'm doing this? And I said, well, no, we, we can't. We just give the therapies and then we'll follow up post the, the fourth infusion. And she went, okay. She said, well, that's good. It's like a vacation. I don't have to worry about anything. Because we really can't tell as we move along unless something is clinically indicated for us to do something and to intervene. So she took this time as where she was just going to free her mind and take a vacation from it and just let the medication work. Because we can't do anything in that meantime until we finish those four cycles. So I thought that was a really nice way of looking at it. She gave herself a, a, a mental break from worrying about her disease process. Um, um, if there is any, as I mentioned, any um, changes in um, the, the blood values, we will follow those on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, some patients do receive a blood transfusion if they set off with a very low blood count. There's things that we can do to coordinate care with each and every one of you on an independent case-by-case -case -case basis. This is what I wear when I... No. <laughs> All right. This, this is where a lot of the questions are generated, and I really don't think that... I have grown any tentacles or tails since I've been working around this, um, this product um, and working with it for um, quite a while now as well. So let's go into this. Radioactivity. We um, discharge after the infusion, so it's around about four hours post-injection. We follow the um, NRC guidelines, which is the Nuclear Regulatory Committee guidelines, and we measure you, as you saw in the previous picture, with a meter stick. It's very technical. And we'll just hold um, a dose reader up to you to measure what radiation that you're reading off. And that'll give us a, a, a reading, and it's measured in millirems per hour. The NRC guidelines are we can discharge you if you're below five. If you're above five, then we should keep you in hospital and monitor you until you go below five. We have never been, I think 2.3 was our highest, but on average, it's 1.5, 1.3, are, some are, you know, like 90.97. They're sort of all over the place, but we, we have never, ever hit five. So we're well below those um, uh, release criterias. 
um, and we follow the Alara principle. You may have heard it, you may not have heard it, and it's just basically, it's to keep occupational and public doses as low as reasonably achievable. And that's exactly what we do. We have to respect something that we can't see, smell, or taste. I, I don't, I've never tasted it before, but we, we have to just respect, you know, it's something that we can't see. So it's something that is, it's very fearful. You see those big signs and you think, my gosh, I'm radioactive. I'm giving off something. I'm going to be you know, transporting this radioactivity to somebody else that I love and I don't want them to get damaged by it. It's, it's really not like that, but it's good to have a healthy understanding of something so you know how to, you know, deal with it moving forward. Okay, it's a radioactive compound, we know that, because we're infusing it. The half-life of something, it's explained the time is taken with the radioactivity of a, speci um, a, spe a specified isotope to fall to half of its original value. We infuse 200 molecules of Lutathera PRRT LU177 into you for your dose. It's one dose, fits all. What we're seeing here is the physical half-life, that's something that's sitting on a table that's in that vial. After 6.7 days, it'll have gone from 200 molecules down to 100 molecules. There's also a biological half-life, and that's what you're passing off, that's what's decaying inside the body. So there's a lot of parts to encompass in this. But what the, main, the main things that you need to be taking away today is, is that you're receiving a dose, most of it comes off in the urine, within the first five hours. You're gonna basically, 44% of it's gonna be washed out when you go to the toilet. That's why we have you go to the restroom, okay? In 24 hours, it's gonna be down by 58%, and in two days, 65% is gonna be out of your body. What else has gone into the tumor is in the tumor, and it's doing its job trying to kill those cells. The rest is gonna be taken off. The main focus is on three days post-injection. We just want to be cognizant of that we need to be careful with our urine and how we dispose of the urine in those first three days. Sitting on the toilet for men and for women, using a tissue, washing our hands, just being respectful of the urine has radioactivity in it. Feces has some radioactivity. Vomit has some radioactivity in it too. It goes down the toilet, it's flushed away. What we need to do and remember is if you have um, uh, depends or you um, soil yourself with a lot, of, a lot of substance that can't go down the toilet or can't go into a washing machine to be washed, then we will ask you to double bag it if it's heavily soiled and you have issues with continence. Double bag it, place it in a garage and leave it there for about 70 days before you throw it in the trash. We just want to make sure that the dose to the public and everybody else is alara, as low as reasonably achievable. So we're respectful of that. If you have soiled clothes, you're going to wash them in the washing machine. If you um, um, throw up, you're going to clean it up, flush it down the toilet, wash your hands. If you can put some gloves on, you can, but it's those first three days that we're looking at. But we are discharging you below regulatory guidelines. So I'm being super cautious, but we want to be super respectful as well. Questions about what we get asked, I put a few up here. These are like the, the biggest ones that keep sort of circulating around. I think the, the main one that kind of is, uh, um, holds close to my heart is when can I hold my grandchild again? There's a lot of patients that have come through and their um, daughter was having a baby, they wanted to hold the baby. Um, seven days is a recommended thing that I, would, um, that I gave her. Seven days and you can hold the baby. This, the time and distance and shielding thing, when we look at being around radioactivity, and that's when we do give the therapy, I am not sitting on your lap while the therapy is going in. I am in the room with you while all that's happening, but I have a distance around me, and that drops off every time I step away from you, that my exposure, my exposure um, reduces when I go back in distance. So I can be around this point for as long as I want, as long as I'm not sitting on your lap while we're giving the therapy. And that's the same aspect of what you've got to use when you go home. You're going to make sure that you've got distance between you. You can sleep in the same bed. You're only going to be in the bed unless you're in the bed for 24 hours. It's going to be eight hours overnight. You've already passed out most of that um, excretory mechanism <coughs> after the therapy. You're not going to cause any innate damage to your partner while you're sleeping in the same bed. You're just not going to be lying on top of them. It's just kind of respectful <laughs> doing it that way. Um, 
it's, I, 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 I really want to get it across. It's really if you're at the source and you're on that source for a long period of time, that's when the likelihood increases. Um, interesting note, if you flew from New York to LA, I'm sure there's a song in there too, um, it's a six hour flight, 3.5 milliram you're gonna receive. If you return flight in 12 hours, you're gonna receive seven. So just to try and give it some context, and that's cosmic radiation that we're looking at. This is still radiation that you're receiving in your body, but you're not sitting on top of that radiation for, um, to receive it all in one go. It's, you've got to spread, spread it out, step back away from it. Okay. Finishing all four infusions um, and follow-up. Um, the um, NCC uh, guidelines, they recommend to follow up um, every uh, three, six, and nine months based on your clinical presentation and follow up with scans. You can follow up with um, a gallium 68 dotatate scan, or you can follow up with the imaging that you had when you started, um, a contrast enhanced MRI, a CT scan. Whatever your modality was when they monitored you from the beginning, the gold standard is the gallium 68 scan, because we're looking and we're comparing apples to apples. But if you had a, an, um, an MRI um, contrast enhanced image and it showed your tumors there then they'll compare that in three months with that scan also as too. they just want to make sure that we're consistent with the imaging that we do and your blood work will follow up at the same as well and obviously your imaging as well if you are going to get a scan less than one month um, that's going to be if it's clinically indicated or if they think things have changed your next step you're going to maintain on your um, uh, somatostatin analog injections. Um, there is no reason to take you off those, even if you progressed already on the, on when you were receiving those injections. The NETA-1 trial still maintained that you received those, but if you wanted to come off them, that would be a discussion that you'd have with your um, oncologist um, moving forward. Um, questions that came up as well, can I re receive PRRT again? Yes, you can receive PRRT again. Um, we have pa patients that have come through for retreatment. Um, it's going to be a discussion that's going to be had of how well the, the treatment worked in the first place and how long it was before you went to progression again. And then you can, if all, you meet the criteria to go ahead and move forward, then you can receive two more treatments. Advancing combination treatments, this is moving forward. Uh, Dr. Barry men mentioned moving, um, you know, what are we doing in the future? Um, Sequencing prior to surgery, the sequencing is using PRRT before you can go in maybe for surgery or doing two PRRTs and then doing something in between and then doing another PRRTs. These are all new things and exciting things that are coming forward and how we're looking at placing this therapy into conventional therapies as well. Basically, so you can get the best um, use out of your toolbox as possible. And also addition um, of radio sensitizers. This is by using different medications to enhance the performance of the PRRT so that the DNA damage in the cell is not repaired. It maintains to be damaged, to, so it enhances that therapy and that's something that we're looking at moving forward to. And I think that was everything. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Regina Gadsen. I'm actually a management service officer and I work on the administrative side of nuclear medicine. <laughs> and my, my team is basically dedicated to uh, taking care of you as far as consultations are concerned, scheduling, um, your lab work, uh, making sure that uh, you are aware of your calendar of activities, you know, from the beginning of the uh, consultation. Um, so basically we have some prerequisites before you get on board a consultation. And it begins, of course, with a doctor's referral. And that referral should include the following uh, items. Um, it should have records of your previous treatments, uh, medical notes of your medical history, and also relevant lab results. And the most important one of them is actually the PET-CT which is the gallium-68 dotatate, uh, more commonly known as the net spot. And it should be at least uh, within uh, at least six months. It should be recent because that would be the basis of the consultation uh, for the doctor to um, decide whether you are qualified for the Lutathera. If you don't have uh, the, the net spot, the nuclear medicine octreotide, uh, 
we can use that, but you know, Nespot is proven to be more superior in delivering better images so that our doctor can, you know, um, make a better decision in helping you. Um, we do have uh, some uh, patients that come from uh, outside UCLA and referred uh, by doctors uh, who also are uh, also outside from UCLA, and we require them to uh, submit the, their demographics, of course, the doctor's information, including the NPI and the tax IDs, and uh, of course, the patient's insurance card. So this is how it looks like, you know, this is the clinic workflow that, you know, basically that has been discussed. Um, uh, Lindy already had discussed this part, and I'll be discussing this four parts, you know, from the consultation. So basically the consultation is, uh, this is where, you know, like Dr. Barry had explained earlier, you know, what is the process of the therapy? And he explains all the uh, uh, risk and benefits and possible side effects and also therapy charges. <laughs> and I know very, very most of you would be interested to hear that. Um, you can also ask as many questions as you want during the consultation. And if the patient consents to, uh, you know, scheduling the first cycle, uh, on the first, on the, on the date of the consultation, you will get this uh, information. It's actually a calendar of activities. The first one, you will have the first set of lab tests which is normally about two to four weeks uh, before the infusion date. And this one would be at least 48 hours before the infusion date. And that will be your therapy schedule. And uh, this is actually the uh, uh, lab test that we will require uh, from the patients. It will be the CVC, the platelet with differential, and of course the CMP. Um, so like I said, it's two to four weeks, two sets. We will normally give you a call, just give you a reminder call, make sure you don't miss that, because that's very important. Our doctors review it. And uh, also, by the way, I w forgot mentioning uh, the images of the gallium dotate, uh, gallium 68 dotate net spot uh, before the consultation. Uh, we require you to bring the, the report and send the CD of the images so our doctors can review that prior, prior to you coming for a consultation. Because if, if, uh, if the images says that, you know, this patient is not uh, qualified, then we, at least we don't waste your time coming over here for a consultation. So this is basically what it looks like. You know, the, we, you know we also require a doctor to uh, put an order in for Lutathera. This is the most important part, where they put the diagnosis. Because the diagnosis code need to be at least um, compatible with, uh, these are the ICD codes that Lutathera can be covered with your insurance. Anything outside of this, if your doctor, because your doctor would be the one responsible in putting the diagnosis code. If it's not uh, in the FDA approved guideline, then you may not be covered by your insurance. And uh, it's hard for us, you know, to, to tell the doctor, hey, doctor, can you change the diagnosis on this so your patient will be covered and they don't get that bill? It's so hard because, you know, ethically, it's not correct. It should be the doctor, you know. But all of this information, though, you can make a suggestion to your doctor. They, he can look it up in the Luthathera website. It's www.luthathera.com. So he also signs a letter of medical necessity. This letter actually uh, deliberates uh, why is it, for, is, it, is it medically necessary for you to get the Lutathera. And usually insurance companies look for this when we submit the information for your coverage. Now this is actually a financial assistance application form. During the consultation, we will ask you to fill this out just in case you get a denial. This is a form from the manufacturer because the manufacturer will actually help us, you know, if you, they do have some criteria that, that you need to meet um, uh, in, 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 for you to be able to uh, get coverage. 
So, like I said, it's your provider's responsibility to identify the appropriate diagnosis. It should be based on the FDA guidelines. And usually the insurance process uh, takes about 15 to 30 days. But what, you know, that, this is what we set initially last year, but we are finding it out more 30 days than 15 days. <laughs> you know, um, so, but you know, the thing of it is, you don't want to schedule a patient and uh, it's, it's, it's like a dilemma because you want to schedule the patient and give them the treatment, but then you also want to make sure that the patient doesn't get the bill. So it's, and, the, and, and the, the part of it is like, you know, once we get the authorization, it takes us at least 21 days to order the dose. Sometimes the manufacturer is good to us and would, you know, Lindy would pull her charisma and uh, ask, can you deliver us a dose in one week? Sometimes it could be done, but it's never, you know, it's, ne it's never the rule. It's more than the exception. So if in case you still get a denial after all the, sub the paperwork that we had submitted, um, we will appeal and uh, we will move on to a peer-to-peer -peer review with their medical director, including our uh, attending physicians. And hopefully you get approved. But let's say you still get denied. This is where that paperwork I told you, the, the financial assistance form, will come into play because uh, the manufacturer will be willing to help cover part of the cost. They do have their own guidelines in the website. And um, this is one of them. If you have a, a coverage, uh, actually an insurance, a commercial insurance coverage, this is the criteria that they have. Uh, as long as it's done uh, in a hospital or a physician outpatient setting, then you know they will they will provide you financial assistance. And if the patient is a permanent resident of the United States, but this does not cover any government insurance, anything that is Medi-Cal, Medicare, Medicaid, not covered. So you cannot get any copay assistance if you have that kind of insurance. Um, so receiving the copay, if you if you are qualified, they will send you a letter and they will stipulate to you the guidelines, the next steps on what you need to do. Um, basically what they would ask you primarily is to get the proof of treatment. And uh, it might, your claim must be submitted to uh, AAA. They will send you the payment. So the, the doctor's office or the institution, UCLA will, out, will be out of this uh, loop. It will be the patient directly coordinating it to AAA or the manufacturer. They also provide financial uh, assistance to uninsured patients at no cost. And these are the guidelines for that. They need proof of financial uh, difficulty, of course. And um, of course, you know, the patient also needs to be a permanent resident of the United States. Uh, ballpark figure right now, just the vial for the Luthera is about $37,000. Uh, but that does not include the cost of infusion. Yeah. Uh, th this is the information for uh, financial uh, assistance. But, you know, like I said, you can go to www.luthera.com. All this information and all the forms are available there. Or you can call their number. 844-NETS-AAA, and they will assign a patient navigator to you. So this is, um, this is actually the enrollment process. So you, you basically uh, ex access the enrollment forms on this website and um, fill that out and then sign it off and uh, submit it. And that's their fax number you'll be able to speak to a patient navigator, they will contact you, and they will be the one who hold your hand, help you through the process. Because like, you know, like Dr. Barry had said, and Lindy had said, every patient is different from the other. So, uh, I, you know, we, we ha just so you know, we don't have any patients yet that had gone through this, so far as UCLA is concerned. All of our patients, uh, ever since we got F FDA approved, 
uh, all of them have been uh, approved by the insurers. So, and like I said, you know, it takes uh, 21 days for Lutathera to be delivered. It actually, before, during the uh, clinical trial stage, it would come from uh, Italy, and we had been through a lot of problems, you know, logistically. S there was a time that, you know, our Lutathera dose were stuck somewhere in the middle of a snowstorm because, you know, there were, not, there were no flights going out of Italy. One time we had received a, a Mini Cooper in place of our Lutathera, so, you know, <laughs> those things happen. So, and like, our Lutathera is sitting somewhere with a guy who ordered a Mini Cooper emblem. <laughs> <laughs> Those things happen, but um, now it's in New Jersey, so we're happy. Now, that, that's why I said, you know, although it's 21 days, uh, AAA has been very good to us, and they would deliver the dose even just in a short notice of a week. Okay. And so, like I said, this is, a, this is what I will cover. If you call me, I may not have the answers all the time. I'm a good patient advocate, and so is my team. Um, don't overthink. You know, we'll find the answers for you, because we know where to find them. We don't have them all the time, but definitely we'll find them for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was one of the best presentations on the full spectrum of what the treatment is, why you might need it, when to do it how to get it, what happens when you're there that day, and who wouldn't want to see Lindsay, Lindy for those five hours while they're there? Charisma is uh, as totally accurate. And Regina, to help you get through the entire process of knowing about your insurance and approvals and everything. Thank you very much for doing this today. Um, so who would be the first point of contact for a patient who thinks that this is right for them? That will be me. <laughs> yeah, just, just call me. Uh, I have my business cards outside. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I'm going to ask you the first questions. You need to have this, this, and this. Have them ready. And uh, come over here in the uh, light have them ready. The if you have uh, copies of your uh, most recent, uh, most recent uh, octreotides or nest pots, just send them with your CD and I will have immediately a doctor review that and see if you are a qualified candidate for uh, Lutothero. It all begins with that CD of net, uh, net spot. And Great. All. So she's talking about cost at 37000 per vial. Yes, ma'am. Approximately. Would that be per, for, uh, per, per eight infusion? Week? Per eight weeks. So every, per eight weeks. So yes. every time you go, it's 37000 no. That is just or for the vial. Total. Right, but so you have four treatments? Yes, ma'am. So 37,000 times for four. For the vial. For the that vial. does not include... Yeah, no, 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 for the vial. I, yeah, I understand yeah, yeah. that. I just wanted to verify that it was each time you go. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. One second. For the... What would be the cost overall? Oh, good yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm just asking for the total cost of what it would cost for everything besides just the injection, the care, the infusion, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I can only give you a ballpark figure, uh, including the infusion and everything is about almost close to $147,000 for one cycle. And that's why we encourage you to get your insurance, which, by the way, I would like to mention, you know, if you have your insurance already in place, please let us know if you change your insurance or if you're employed and your insurance somehow changed because your employer had switched, you know, your benefits. We need to know that so we can resubmit in that way because we had some patients before, they, you know, by the turn of the year, the employer changed the, the benefits of the insurance. The employee didn't even know. Patient didn't even know. So he got the bill. So, and it, that really is very, really very, very painful. So. And that's true for pretty much anything. If yeah. your insurance changes, you want that to be aware, whether it's surgery or anything else. Yeah. So, any other questions? Okay, currently I have Kaiser 
as my fabulous insurance plan. Um, and I've had to go outside to seek special specialists. Um, um, this would be the third specialist that I've come to would be you guys. Um, in reference to this, my problem is getting Kaiser to agree to even do alternative treatments as, I mean, it's not considered alternative, but additional treatments and they don't do it in house. How would I go back to them in reference to push them this way in order to get you guys involved? Well, actually Kaiser is uh, a one of uh, the the bigger, uh, uh, I would say, uh, medical institutions that actually refer their patients to us. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of Kaiser patients. Kaiser is one of the uh, uh, medical institutions that actually does not require those diagnoses to be in place. They can go out of that criteria because they are their own you know, uh, insurance company anyway. And, and from my uh, experience, I would see patients that we had uh, treated in the past, some of them would just have a copay of 25 bucks, some of them would have zero, some of them would have 50, 50 bucks. So, yeah. And I don't have to worry about Kaiser because Kaiser, when they say go, you know, there's the authorization is there, I know we're gonna get paid. Yeah, it's never a problem. They're not one company that would say, oh, we missed that, we're not gonna pay that. They don't do that over there. Yeah, we just need a referral rather from them and uh, of course the rest of the stuff like you know, medical notes and uh, imaging. Yes, sir. Any other, let me pass you the mic. Thanks so much for the excellent presentations. So a quick question about what happens to any potential damage to healthy cells from this therapy. So it sounds like it, the um, radioactive molecule attaches to the receptor on the cancer cells. A lot of it gets flushed out with urine um, or through urine. Is there any damage to normal cells? Yes. Um, there is going to be some damage, but it is going to be minimal. Um, basically, the whole idea of targeted therapy is, as you could see, the Cancer cells are the, one, are the ones that express that somatostatin receptor predominantly, okay? But we know, for example, the normal kidney cells in the tubuli, they have the somatostatin receptor too. That's why we have to protect the kidney. Um, basically, with these types of protections, uh, we are at a level where we feel it's very safe. And for most of the patients, it's very safe. Yes, as with everything else, there's always a trade-off. The trade-off is that you're gonna damage some of the cancer, uh, of the healthy cells, but it is not a big um, problem at this point. Do we have any, oh, one second. <laughs> it's okay. So have you done any experimentals with um, having your patients fast prior to procedures to see that it would protect the healthy cells versus the, during it? Um, I believe not, right? And I don't think that fasting would do anything in that respect. There, was an ins there is an institution that had some episodes where the patients were very nauseous and had a lot of diarrhea, and they were fasting the patients beforehand to see if it helped with the diarrhea and the nausea. Um, but that's obviously um, associated with the amino acid compound. Um, but there, there was two institutions that were trying to fast prior because of that, but it wasn't to do with the uh, cell internalization. It was to do with nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. We have one question on the live stream, um, and it is also about Kaiser. So if somebody has a problem with Kaiser and getting a referral, is it okay for them to call you, Regina? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up then if, if every, no one else has any further questions. I want to thank Dr. Bari, Lindy Gardner, and Regina Gadsen from UCLA for being here today. Thank you so much. And thank you to UCLA for uh, hosting us. You're so gracious and the wonderful lunch that you provide for everyone here. Thank you for everyone on the live stream. And we will see you May 11th, Saturday, with Dr. Eric Liu at the Cancer Support Community. And don't forget, June 8th, our big conference. Thanks. Yay.